Okay, we have Victor, one of our own. He's a professor in the physics department and a, um, I guess, a founding fellow of JQI. One of the founding fellows of JQI. He's a little bit shy here, but uh, uh, he um, hails from the Ukraine, as many of you know, and he's been uh, keeping us informed of some of the things going on there. Uh, he um, went to uh, Landau Institute to get his PhD. And so he's uh, well versed in condensed matter and things of that sort. And he's got papers that run from uh, what high magnetic fields to what did I say here, to uh, high correlation, strong correlation. And today he's going to talk about something slightly different. But um, uh, let's see. But the other thing about Victor, he's sort of a Renaissance guy. He right. He 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 worries about things like power in your house. And if you're interested in anything that has to do with power outside the grid, like uh, solar cells, he's your guy. And he's been doing this for some time. He now actually has geothermal. So when everybody else is out of power, he's able to work. So graduate students, listen to that. So he also, uh, he gave a really interesting colloquium a few years ago on finance, using StatMech to study finance. Um, and he's actually got money. He had money from one of these institutions that gave him some money to study this. So, and uh, so, but today he's going to talk about physics, that what we know, and his title, there it is, uh, using circularly polarized light or stirring for topological memory of uh, in turn insulators, direct current, neutral atoms, optical lattices. So, Victor, thank you. Okay, Th thank you. Okay, let me put microphone. Um, so maybe I press some button accidentally when I put it on. Okay, so is my sound good uh, on, on the Zoom? I mean, on Zoom, not here. Zoom. Yep, you sound good, Victor. Okay, great, great. Okay, fine. So let me start. <sighs> okay, so yeah. Uh, so sorry for the somewhat long title. It's really the abstract of the talk. Okay, so <laughs> three lines. It's these three lines in the title. Uh, uh, mimic, mimic, basically mimic the the the, the outline of the talk. So. Um, so this work was done with uh, Sergei Pershoguba, who was my for, former student here at Maryland, and currently he is a um, visiting assistant professor at New Hampshire. And the talk is based on two papers uh, with him. OK, so the outline of the talk is this. It really has three parts. So the first part is um, somewhat pedagogical, uh, connected to like textbook material. This is energy shift of atoms and solid in an oscillating electric field, which is also known as Stark shift if it's the direct field or dynamical star shift if it's oscillation electric field. So, so that will be some introductory stuff. But, and then, then this um, framework will be, up, will be applied to two different systems. Systems are really very different. One is basically churn oscillator, um, which is, has been observed in uh, graphene by layers, twisted graphene by layers. And the proposal will be to use circular polarized light to control the sign of magnetization or quantum hole effect, churn number, et cetera, in these systems. And second part, or third part, uh, would be quite a different system. This will be bosons in optical lattice. So you know, it's very different from reactions in solids, but it will use the same mathematical formalism. So the same mathematical results presented in the first part will be applied to these two different systems, okay? As electrons in solids and bosons in optical lattices, okay? So let us start, okay? So let, with the first part. So very brief reminder of this uh, uh, stark shift um, in atoms. Okay so, uh, okay, so let's say we have some atom. It has some energy levels, okay? So then we put this atom in electric field. And uh, so there is electric field. And it's maybe, it's, let's say it, it's time dependent oscillates at frequency omega. It couples to the, uh, to the electric dipole moment of the, of the, uh, to the dipole moment of the electrons. And so bottom line is in the presence of this electric field, some, some dipole moment uh, will be induced Okay, some expectation, there will be some expectation value of electric dipole moment and the coefficient of proportionality between say polarization, I mean electric uh, polarization and electric field, that's called the polarizability tensor. Okay, but also um, at the same time, the energy, energy levels will get shifted. So energy levels will get shifted by 
uh, by the second order perturbation theory in the electric field, there will be shifted with a same polarizability tensor in front. So bottom line, there will be energy shift uh, of, of a, a shift of energy levels, okay? Described by the same polarizability tensor. And this polarizability tensor, as you can see, is the second order tensor, right? So it can be separated into uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric part. Okay, which couple correspondingly to symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of electric field. And this operation will be very important as we go down the line. So this is pretty much textbook stuff. Um, but now I want to do, I, I want to now go from, from, yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, what does it even mean to talk about energy levels? The what is it? What does it mean to talk about energy levels since the Hamiltonian is time dependent? Yes, very good point, very good point. So, Yes, okay, so the question is the following. The question is this. Now we apply a time-dependent perturbation, so the Hamiltonian is time-dependent. And the question is, what do we mean by energy levels if Hamiltonian is not time-dependent? time, is time dependent? The answer is, these are really 4K eigenenergies. So these are really 4K eigenenergies, okay? So yes, it's 4K, it's, the whole thing is 4K frame, framework. And uh, yeah, it's 4K framework. But the point is that, first of all, I will use perturbation theory in electric field, so let's see. Uh, Okay, so that means I will only always do only to the second order. This is always perturbative. And so if you had some energy levels, well defined energy levels without perturbation, then this perturbation is shift slightly. Okay, although technically these are now flow K eigenenergies. Okay, but to, to keep uh, language short, I will call them simply energy, even though this is really flow K eigen, flow K eigen energy. Uh, and same for momentum, it, in, in, a, in a crystal, it's really quasi-momentum, but I'll use a momentum for, for shortness. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's a very important point, because the whole thing is Floquet formalism, okay? Even though this word may not actually appear explicitly on my slides, but it, it, it is, it is. Okay, great, so now let's go, yeah, do you like questions? Well, Phillips, uh, yes. I mean, this is, is, is probably a pretty trivial question, but, but I was wondering over the one quarter, I was expecting a one half. <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> yes, 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 Bill. The so Bill asking uh, is asking very, very, very good questions. So there's one quota. Yes, when we teach, when I teach, you know, I, I get actually I, I have one half. And the reason why I have one half because because in Sakurai, we, the textbook that I use, it only considers the case without you know time dependence. Only considers static electric field. So if you apply static electric field, then indeed the coefficient is one half. However, when you apply as, as oscillation electric field. Then you see they have, have terms, you know, I omega and minus I omega. Okay, when you plug them here and average over time. So technically, the way this is obtained, this is really time averaged. Uh, you know, this 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 energy shift is obtained by time averaging. And because you do time averaging, the cross terms because plus and minus I omega. In other words, there are terms which are at zero frequency and at double frequency. And because you average over time, double frequency term get average to zero, and that changes uh, one half to one quarter. So indeed, there is there is this jump effectively from one half to one quarter when you go from time independent to DC to AC electric field. Okay, is right. that clear? Yeah, okay. I, I, I I think another way of saying it is that that the E that you've got there is the um, uh, is the the peak E rather than the RMS. Mm -hmm. And if you had, if you'd use the RMS, then it would have been a half. It's fine, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. These things are obtained by the, 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 obtained by time averaging. Exactly. Okay. Right. Okay. Great. So anyway, now we go from uh, from 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 an atom. Okay, the discrete localized system. Uh, I mean, localized system with discrete energy spectrum. We go to to a, to a lattice, to a crystal. So in crystal, of course, the wave functions are block wave functions. So they basically characterized by you know discrete band index n, which roughly speaking corresponds to this discrete index. But they also have now quasi momentum k, which I call for, for, for shortness momentum. Okay, so we have basically continuous variable k and discrete index n. Okay, uh, and so the notation will be the e n m would be the difference e n minus e m. Okay, so the question is, what is the corresponding formula? What is this energy? Now we take this crystal, okay, and put it in oscillation electric field. And you ask, what is the energy shift of what is the shift of these energy levels? Okay, so notice, yeah, what is the shift of energy, you know, energy eigenstates in the presence of oscillation electric field? And this is basically the answer. And now it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so it has actually four terms. So these terms at the, at the, at the end, these are inter are, these are interband terms. So this is basically obtained by standard second order perturbation theory 
between different bands. So this is E and M. So this is, you know, involves one band and another band. So essentially, this term essentially the same as in discrete atom system. The only difference you add uh, variable K, you know, momentum variable. And this R, this is basically the matrix elements of, uh, of electric dipole. But because we are working on a crystal, it turns out that this matrix element of dipole actually represent Berry connections. So what is Berry connections? You take this U, the periodic part of the Bloch wave function. It is labeled by momentum K. You take derivative momentum K, and that gives you matrix element of, uh, of, of coordinate. As usually, this is coordinate, this is momentum, so it's usual the kind of, uh, uh, what is it, conjugate variables. Okay. So anyway, this, this last two, these two terms are kind of standard and the same as here. Uh, one term has minus i omega, uh, h omega, one has plus h omega. So basically, roughly speaking, they correspond to intermediate state in virtual intermediate state where the photon is either absorbed, virtually absorbed or virtually emitted. And these are known as Stark, this is called Stark shift and this is block Seeger shift. So these are very well known. But in addition to these terms, it turns out uh, there are also intraband terms. So these are interbands, uh, these are intraband terms. And of course, so this comes from, from the same band, okay? Because it has a variable K momentum. Okay, so these terms do not exist. Uh, in atom, because atom is localized system spectrum is discrete, so there is no momentum and there is no band, etc. So there are two extra terms. And as to my knowledge, I mean, I have not seen the literature. If anybody knows, please give me, let me know, give me the reference. But basically, we derive them with Sergey, we derive these terms. And uh, so these are intraband terms, and they play a very important role in the rest of the talk. And I will explain the origin in the next couple of slides. Okay? Yes, and they can be separated into symmetric and anti-symmetric. I should also say that um, the coefficient, the coefficient for, um, sorry, for this anti-symmetric omega, this is Berry curvature, and Berry curvature is, you know, again derivative curl uh, of, of of Berry connection. Yeah, question. So the, the first part of the slide. Yes. Atom, yes. Orbital, mm -hmm. and dipolar. Mm -hmm. In the second part, you assume that the electron is free. Yes. In the valence and conduction. Mm -hmm. Which is fine. Mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But in most of semiconductors, you, you make exciton. Yes. Yes. Which are bound. Yes. So mm -hmm. uh, then I need to modify that like, what part of my exciton is in the valence and the Right, right, yeah. So the, that's mm -hmm. why it's omega is not manifestly written in the state. Oh, you mean, you mean, oh, you mean, I mean, these terms, okay, yeah. okay, 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 so yes. I have to see how much of my excitation is in the balance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, 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 uh, okay, so the question was to repeat the question. The point is, this is to be clear, this is done in approximation of non interaction elections. So this is just non-interaction particles subject to periodic potential, that is it. So interaction like Coulomb interaction between electrons completely ignored. So this is the starting point, the baseline starting point of non-interaction particles. It's certainly true that uh, in actual materials, there is Coulomb interaction. And if you try to excite an electron, you get electron hole pair and they will form bound state, which is exciton. And exciton is a bound state. And so because it is a bound state, to some, in some sense in exciton, we go back to this situation. Okay, so so let's let's put it this way: there are certainly complications uh, because because of interaction, in particular formation of excitons. If but but there is some caveat here: if if you actually excite, if you create electron hole pairs. Okay, now let me clarify for the rest of the talk: the regime that I want to consider. You let me consider different regimes. These are general equations, but I want to consider a regime where the frequency of uh, of, of 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 the light is such that. Uh, there are no resonant transitions. In other words, let's say the frequency of light is below the gap. That, that's typical case, okay? The typical situation I want to consider. So the frequency is below the gap. So photons cannot be absorbed. So this is what's called transparent regime. Okay, frequency below the gap, photons just propagate through the crystal without absorption. So they do not create excitons because they cannot be absorbed. So these terms basically represent virtual, you know, virtual corrections, okay? And that is the regime that I will consider. I will systematically avoid uh, I want to avoid this question when, when photons absorb and excitations are created. I want to be stay away from it when excitations are not created. And then the only thing that we have these virtual shifts, okay? So, so anyway, so excitations may be a problem, but I want to stay away from it if, if I may, okay? Uh, yes, Jay also has, if I want to continue or? I, I'm happy if we assume that the interaction is untapped. Yes, yes. If the interaction is there, then I have, I have F-tons. 
yes, there is some rules in everything, right? Let me put the short answer. Yeah, okay, yes, short answer is taking account of interaction is above my pay grade. <laughs> okay, yes. I'm not sure there's a clear answer to this, so, so but, but I'll throw the question out anyway. So it's um, my question is it, uh, when you think about the electric field, are you literally taking Q equals zero or is there a Q goes to zero? Ah, yes, good because point. Mm -hmm. If I literally take Q equals zero, it's conceptually difficult for me to see how there's any difference between the two. Uh, between what? Between which two? Which two? And the atom case, because once ah. I fix K, if, if Q is zero, yes. then K is conserved, and then yeah. formally the Yes, very good point. So yes, absolutely. So I assume Q equal to zero. In other words, I assume that my electric field is uniform, spatially uniform on whatever scale I consider. Okay. Uh, this is, of course, an approximation like, you know, does have a wave vector and so on. And, you know, again, uh, it's in, uh, Okay, so wavelength of light is typically much bigger than size of the atom, right? But if I consider crystal, you know, a crystal has some size. So in any case, I will use approximation, which is very common in solid state physics, that the wave vector of light is zero. So it has frequency, but 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 Q is equal to zero. So that means all, all coupling, all transitions, all, all matrix elements here, well, they're all vertical. Vertical mean K coupled to the same K. It's all vertical coupling, okay? But you may ask, you know, then how come I get these two terms? Uh, yes, okay, th that's next couple slides, okay? So because that is a new contribution. I mean, I'm glad that people are kind of skeptical about this term. It shows this are really new. I saw that maybe very well known, but probably not, okay? <laughs> there's any difference between the two at all. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, that's yeah, just that's correct. That's that's correct. So you might ask how come you know we get this you know when 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 k is vertical, etc. There, the, the, this term is somewhat surprising, and that's perhaps they're not known in literature to, to my knowledge, and that's what we derive. So I, I'll explain the next several slides. That is the the essence of the first part, which foundation for the rest. Okay, uh, Victor. Yes. Just uh, a sec. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. So so if I've understood correctly, the the first terms are. Um, the effect of the electric field on, on what are essentially free electrons. Yes. And the, the second two terms are very much like the atomic terms. That is, they're, they're, they're for bound states. Okay. So, Bill, Bill, I, I will explain the first. The, 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 the next several slides will explain in full detail the next, uh, the, the, the new terms. Let, so let's maybe go on to slides to, to discuss okay. new terms because okay, that is sure. And sure. the second two terms are totally agree. This is totally conventional, totally well known. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Jay, Fine. Uh, sorry, sorry. Trey, Trey. So you mentioned operating in a condition where you're in the gap that yes. is not directly excited. Yes. Uh, there are there can be multi photon uh, could be excitations that take yeah. Yes, yes. So the, the, the tray was asking about multi photon excitations. Yes, single photon excitation, I mean, single photon frequency is within the gap, so there are no single photon excitations. But yes, conceivably, you may consider multi photon excitation that will take you above the gap, etc. But again, I ignore all that uh, because, because I will be always systematically working only in the second order perturbation theory. I will not go to any higher order than second order perturbation theory. And so that means I can only deal with one photon. Just because that's my order of perturbation theory. But anyway, I ignore this multi photon things, etc. Okay, so this is a very basic stuff. You know, there may be complications of various kinds, but let's make get, get through basic stuff. And then, you know, you guys can add further, uh, you know, effects on top of it. Okay. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the question was that, yes, I mean, I wrote this interband terms as symmetric and anti-symmetric. The same is true for these terms. These terms, interband terms, they can also be you know, separated into symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. You know, each of them. This term can be split into symmetric and anti-symmetric, and this can be split into symmetric and asymmetric. So this can be done all the way through. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so on this subject of symmetric and anti-symmetric, yes. So let me, that's a very quick slide. So you see, uh, you have, you know, you have basically two kind of product of two tensors, if you like. You have tensor, the second order tensor of electric field, which this is of electric field and M conjugated electric field. Remember this uh, is oscillation of frequency. So E is a complex amplitude of electric field. So this tensor, okay, can be separated in the symmetric part 
and can be separated into anti-symmetric part. This is a symmetric classification, very brief, brief slide. Okay, the, with respect to permutation, symmetric, anti-symmetric, but also it turns out, I mean, follows from this, they also have time, uh, symmetry with respect to time reversal. So the symmetric part is even with respect to time reversal, and the anti-symmetric is odd with respect to time reversal. That's very important because they will focus on time reversal, you know, effects of time reversal, odd effects. And this anti-symmetric tensor, as usual, can be written in terms of a vector. So this will be like axial vector H. So, you know, any, any you know, anti-symmetric tensor of the second order can be written in terms of a vector H. What is this vector H? This is helicity of light. Okay, so this vector H, uh, so in other words, the anti-symmetric part of electric field can be characterized by helicity vector, which is basically this thing. It's again, vector product. Essentially, it's angular momentum of the light. So if, if there is some rotation, of the light, like circular polarization of elliptic polarization, then this light has non-zero helicity, and this is measure of it. If you have linear polarization, then helicity is zero, nothing is rotating. So H is measure essentially of rotation of light. And this vector H helicity of light will show up all the way through the top, okay? And, and also now this question is about symmetric and anti-symmetric. Um, now this, um, this energy corrections to the, this, now this is, when I say Bazio, when I say energy, when I say energy implicitly, I will always mean energy of the electrons. Okay, so, you know, I shine light on electrons and energy of electrons is changed. So when I say energy is always, it's not energy of electric field, it's energy of the electrons or whatever particles in the system. So anyway, this is block, you know, band structure, you know, band structure energy is a bare one. And this is the second order correction, which I showed on the previous slide. And what, this is what I call renormalized energy. So, you know, modified energy to a second order of electric field. And this second order correction can be separated into symmetric and anti-symmetric. Now this is symmetric anti-symmetric with respect to momentum K, okay? Because again, uh, if system has time reversal symmetry, which normally it is, okay, which normally it does, okay? So then this normal, that original dispersion is symmetric with respect to K to minus K because of time reversal symmetry. And that is the original one, okay? But once you apply perturbation, your, your electromagnetic light may have helicity, which breaks time reversal. And as a result, this correction to the um, uh, no band structure, it, it may have symmetric and anti-symmetric parts with respect to momentum. So this anti-symmetric part with respect to momentum comes from anti-symmetric, you know, the, the, the helicity of light and the symmetric comes from symmetric tensor, okay? So this is the certification will go all the way through. And now let me explain the origin of those two terms. Remember those symmetric term and anti-symmetric, okay, which people had, you know, concerns about. Okay, let's explain symmetric term. What is the origin of this term? The point is this. We have electrons in the solid, right? And this is Newton's law, okay? So the time derivative of momentum is equal to the electric force, okay? So electrons are subject to electric force. And as a result, momentum in the presence of electric field, I mean, electric force, momentum technically, technically, is not a good quantum number in a sense that it has dynamics, it depends on time, okay? But our electric field is periodic, right? So basically the, the actual the momentum of, of electron becomes time dependent, but it has some average value, which I call K, and it has some deviation delta K. So essentially uh, the electron momentum in the presence of oscillating electric field, it oscillates in around this average value with around time average value, which I simply call K. So what is what I call momentum is really time average uh, of, of this oscillation momentum, okay? And so, because, and this, and the, the, this, uh, solving, just solving this uh, Newton's equation, the amplitude of oscillation of electron is of the order of electric field divided by frequency because there is time, right? So, so basically the, the, the oscillation of electron is electric field divided by frequency. And this is really the expansion parameter. And this is supposed to be small parameter. So everything we've done perturbation is parameter. That means frequency cannot be too small. So if anybody wants to take limit, you know, in my equations, omega going to zero, DC limit is not gonna work. You know, this is by definition high frequency limit. You cannot take DC result from it. Okay, so anyway, so then what happens? Because electron momentum oscillates, right? You ask, what is the time average energy of the electron? So you simply say, take electron energy, put this oscillation momentum, expand in the small deviations to the first order and second order, then average over time, the first order term averages to zero, but the second order term averages to not zero because right, there is this tensor delta K squared, it becomes uh, electric field squared, right? And because this is symmetric tensor, naturally you get here symmetric tensor of electric field multiplied by the second derivative, but the second derivative of the electron dispersion, okay? So this is basically a natural explanation of this intraband um, symmetric term, the origin of intraband symmetric term, okay? Yeah, 
And while you guys digest it, let me show a few more slides to the end of the slide and we'll discuss a bit more. Okay, so this is, remember, intra-band contribution, right? Now, but it was a correct question was asked. There are also inter-band contributions and they also have symmetric, and it can, symmetric term can be extracted. So this is a full symmetric term. And this is the reason for two-band model, just for simplicity. I mean, it may be more than two bands, but you know, as a toy model, so you usually consider just two bands. So this is the full correction. So this is symmetric respect to electric field. And this is intra-band, which I described above. And this is inter-band, which is, comes from this, you know, perturbation theory. So this is the full expression for this. Now, there is interesting consequence of this. Because of this oscillation of electron momentum, uh, it produces flattening, flattening of electron spectrum. Why is so? Because you see now electron, instead of having well-defined momentum, it averages you know, energy with a neighboring momenta. So average energy gets partially averaged, okay? And so the spectrum becomes actually flatter. And this is illustrated here. So this is, uh, well, we took the simple model here, which I'll discuss later in the third part as well. So this is called uh, basically, you know, one-dimensional zigzag chain with, you know, A, B sub lattices. And so, so the, this, this one, the, the original, this original dispersion, Okay, and the dash line is a normalized dispersion, which takes into account symmetric term, and you see it getting flatter, okay, in the presence of oscillation electric field. Now, this is done kind of perturbatively, but in, because in, in solids, you know, this is always a small parameter. You cannot have too strong electric field, you know, but let's put it more precisely. In solids, the delta K for, for realistic electric field will be much smaller than the brilliant zone size. So averaging is kind of small effect. But in optical lattices, my understanding, you know, you can go to strong regime, and not only you can flatten it, but I mean, there was this PhD defense by um, James Maslick, right? Uh, I mean, last week. And what I learned from this, that in optical lattices, one not only, one can even invert the band, right? By applying oscillation electric field, one can even invert this portion of the band. Okay, but, but in any case, in, in case of stories, it can be flattened. And flattened, flattened is important because uh, they control strong correlation phases, for example, more ray materials, uh, because basically kinetic energy gets reduced. And so strong interaction then become re may become really important. And so you know, this one can use this oscillation electric field to make electron pattern flatter and maybe trigger some stronger correlation transitions, especially in these more ray materials where there is super lattice. Okay, and so unit cell is much bigger. And so the brilliant zone is much smaller, it's folded, so it's much smaller. And then for the small brilliant zone folded, it may be possible that this, uh, it may be comparable, this relation may be comparable in principle, potentially. Okay, so that's it. That's all the questions about the symmetric part. Yes. Yeah, it depends on, you know, it depends on parameters. You know, it depends, fundamentally, it depends on how strong electric field you can apply to your system, how strong laser power you can apply to the, your sample without burning it. You see, because if you apply too much laser power, you know, one way or another, you'll burn it. Okay, so that depends on all details of, you know, setup and everything, right? So this is experimental question, which I don't have an answer in general, but what I'm saying, there is a possibility that, you know, there isn't a possibility and go this way. No, no, it's not excluded. It's, but, but again, keep in mind, this depends on band structure and everything. So it depends on all the actual details of the system. I'm making a general statement. But if one, somebody wants to apply it, in fact, I very strongly encourage people who work with more race, you know, it's twisted, do it, try to do it. But it needs to look specifically, yeah. Uh, okay. So you talk about applying a field so you can flatten the band. Yes. Are you putting on so much field that the theory itself breaks down? Yes, that's correct. So, so that, that, of course, that's correct. So that that that's that, that that will be outside of my. You see, I try to do everything in perturbation theory, and in perturbation theory, you get only a little bit of flattening. Okay. Now, if you, to make it really flat, you can obviously you have to go outside of perturbation theory, apply really strong fields, which people can do in optical lattices. But but in my talk, I will stay in 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 this perturbation regime. So I will not go to that limit of completely flat. Well, but I'm saying this, there is a possibility, but it's outside of my, my kind of scope of calculation. Yeah, uh, Jay? So firstly, a comment on the completely flat. In, in principle, of course, as you alluded to from the cold atom uh, yes. context, it can certainly be done because T, yeah. uh, an oscillating T can even flip. So yeah. you can go from positive to zero. To That's right. Definitely yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is limited by interaction. You correct, correct. And interaction can cause very strong heating. Exactly. Which exactly. in some cases may be avoidable in other scenarios. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Heating is always an issue. If you try to shine, if you try to apply very strong electric field, you inevitably you have to deal with this issue of potential heating. And how it works, it depends on specific, you know, what kind of system, but you know, it depends on all this, you know. I would call it an experiment. It's, it's 
it's something here that can be able. Yes, correct, correct, correct. Oh, yeah, it's correct. Okay, it, it, let's put it this way. It's system dependent issue. Let's put it this way. It's system. It depends on the actual details of the system. Okay, fine. So this is symmetric term, right? This is pretty simple, right? Now let's discuss the origin of anti-symmetric term, okay? And I remember anti-symmetric term exists only for some helicity, so let's consider circular polarized light. It will be zero for linearly polarized light. Okay, so now let's consider a case when the electric field is circularly polarized, so it rotates. I mean, sorry, electric field is rotating, right? And now we solve Newton's equation of motion, you know, electron, electron's equation of motion subject to rotating force. And of course, the solution to this is the orbit of election, meaning in momentum space. Uh, the action will be, will be moving on a circle in momentum space. So this is a little bit like cyclical motion or something. But anyway, so election, election motion in momentum space will be on a circle, but going on the circular orbit. The radius of this orbit will be, of course, electric field divided by H omega. So it will be going over and over like this in momentum space, right? Okay, but now here is a deal. If, if, the band structure if electron, you know, if, if, if electron band structure has Berry curvature, okay, and, and in many cases it does, if there is Berry curvature, then when the electron goes over one cycle around this closed orbit, it accumulates Berry phase. So the Berry phase accumulated in one loop, okay, in one cycle is equal to Berry curvature times the area enclosed by, by the orbit, which is of course, you know, pi times delta k, the radius of the orbit. And the radius of the orbit, remember, is electric field squared, right? So basically in one turn, election accumulates Berry phase, which is Berry curvature, uh, you know, at, at, this, at this point, okay, times square of electric field and some other parameters, okay? But the problem is that election keep doing this. It runs over and over and over and over. So after every turn phase increases and increases and increases. So basically as a result, the electron phase increases linearly in time. There is linear accumulation of phase in time, but if phase increases linearly in time, that means there is energy. That means there is energy shift. Okay, so, so, and so if you divide phase accumulation for one period, okay, that gives energy shift. Uh, and this is exactly the Berry curvature at this point times electric field squared divided by H omega, okay? So that's basically the origin of, of, of this, of this uh, anti-symmetric term. And I'll show one more thing. Uh, so this is the intraband term, okay? This is the intraband term, but there is also interband term, remember, which also has anti-symmetric part. Uh, and if you combine them together, you'll get this expression. This expression is written for two band model. It's a little bit more complicated if there are more than two bands, but for two bands, particularly simple. So basically, if you combine intraband and interband, you still have the same structure, which is, well, basically the structure you have is dot product of helicity of light, Okay, the antisymmetric part of light dot product with Berry curvature, this momentum k, and there is some coefficient that depends on you know energy difference, omega, etc. Okay, if your frequency is much more than energy, you know, energy gap, then this will go to one, and this reproduces this result. Okay, so bottom line is in the present, if, when you shine heli helical light, you know, circular helical, you know, helical light, uh, then there is antisymmetric uh, shift of uh, energy shift of electron state. Okay, I will show a few more things, but any questions about this? Okay, yes. Uh, yes, uh, yes, okay, good point. Uh, yes, okay, well, good point, good point. Yeah, that's what gave a good question. The question is like semi-classical argument, that's correct. So what I presented is semi-classical argument in this slide and the previous slide, but in fact, in the paper, we did actually full calculation. So it's really, you know, you, you do like, you know, real, real, real calculation and that's why everything follows, okay? Yeah, yeah. so it, it follows from actually systematic calculation, yes. This is just for, for, for illustration, semi-classical argument, yes. Uh, question on Zoom, Bill? Yes. So, uh, well, first a comment, then a question. The comment yes. is that I think that that the intra-band term, the, the sort of new term that you're talking about, in atomic physics is what we call the ponderomotive force. Mm -hmm. Now, it's typically something that we'll apply to a free or almost free electron. Mm -hmm. I've never heard it applied to a band structure the way you have, so I think that's, mm -hmm. that's completely new. But at least it... Um, uh, it does have a, uh, a name in atomic physics. Uh, it'd be interesting to know if anybody else there uh, sees this as being the same thing as the ponderomotive force. But my question is, what about orbital angular momentum of the light? You, you also have angular momentum. Is it going to also produce uh, this kind of an anti-symmetric energy shift? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess the story is this, that if you simply have 
rotation of electric, if you have an electric field, which is spatially uniform, but rotates, the, the vector E, you know, rotates, that's like, uh, like spin, you know, it's basically the spin angular momentum of light, yes. right? Exactly. Yes, right. If you want orbital, then you, you have to consider inhomogeneous electric field, right? Right. Uh, like vortex or something, right? Yes, and exactly. again, this is outside of the scope of my talk. This is ah, another generalization, okay. which, you know, somebody can do if they like. But again, in my talk, I stay with spatially uniform light because there are already too many, you know, you know, these are extra bells and whistles that can be added. And I already spent like, well, 40 minutes of my talk. So, so yeah, so there are all kinds of directions. We can refer to you. Uh, we, we thought about it, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, right, uh, right. That's right. That's right. I can, I can talk to you. E exactly, exactly. So yeah. So Bill, talk to Hafezi. He he already did it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. Uh, but anyway. So but going on. So this is but this is energy shift of just one electron. Meaning you know a particular state is given n or given k. But you can also integrate for the whole thing and get energy shift of the whole system, the whole sample. Okay, so this will be energy U, the total energy shift U. You simply take this term and you simply integrate over momentum over the brilliant zone. So if you take this whole thing, integrate over brilliant zone, technically you have to put occupation factor actually, you know, just occupation function, of course. Uh, and the A is the area, A is the area of the sample. Okay, so the, and it gets some vector M. So as after you integrate over all the reactions that you have in the system, you get some this very curvature vector omega translates into some curly m, curly m, and the energy shift of the whole system is equal to you know is not product of helicity of light times this some sort of effective magnetic vector of some this vector you know some, some curly vector m which characterizes some integrated Berry curvature of the system okay and of course this vector, vector m is nothing but remember again uh, you can you can take anti-symmetric part of uh, polarizability and you know anti-symmetric tensor can be always written as a vector and this is this vector okay so the bottom line is the following if you take your sample and the sample is, you know, as we'll see in some next slides what I have in mind is some twisted graphene really if you take some sample you shine circular polarized light. And if, you know, and this important point, if, if this system spontaneously breaks time reversal symmetry, then it may have a non-zero vector M. So you see this vector M uh, would be zero for system, is, is actually zero if system does not break time reversal symmetry. One reason is because, you know, Berry curvature is, you know, changes sign plus minus plus minus K. So it just vanishes by symmetry, okay? So this vector M, is non-zero only for a system that breaks time reversal symmetry. That means system must have some sort of magnetism, you know, time reversal breaking, you can call it magnetism of some sort. But keep in mind, I should say also, I completely ignore spins in this talk. You know, spins are totally out of picture. This is only electric dipole coupling, et cetera. So if I, if system is to have some magnetism, it necessarily can be only like some sort of orbital magnetism. And it comes from motion of reactions in space. So in other words, vector M would be non-zero only for a system that spontaneously breaks time reversal symmetry and has some sort of the orbital, you know, ferromagnetism. Again, ferro because you can have up, down, up, down, it will average to zero. That's not what my interest. I will prefer ferro when it, you know, that does not get to zero. And so if you have some orbital ferromagnet, well, it may have some uh, orbital magnetization M, but this M is like static magnetization, right? That will couple to static magnetic field. But in addition, the system can be characterized by curly M, which is which has same symmetry, which is also, you know, have same symmetry as magnetization, but it's something different. It describes coupling to, to circular light. And of course, this vector M, curly M, depends on frequency omega, et cetera. Okay, so now, okay, I'm a little bit running out of time, boy. Um, so so I, I think this is the end of the, the first theoretical part. Now I'm going to apply it to two particular systems. So the first question will be, are there such systems which break time reversal symmetry and have orbital ferromagnetism, et cetera? Okay, and this is in fact the answer is a twisted graphene by layers, which is next next subject, okay. Yes, 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 yes. People know I did many papers on curl rotation, Faraday rotation, well, but that's short, so no, this will be not in my talk, okay? This is, you know, something different. That was before pandemic, now after pandemic. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. It is correct. It is correct. This, this orbital magnetism can be, and, you know, can be, and, you know, in, in has, and, well, it can be, and in some cases has been probed by curl rotation, et cetera, but that will be not in my talk. Okay. That, that's a different subject. This is different, exactly. 
today is, is not is not repetition of what I told you before, guys. Today is something new, at least for me. Okay. So anyway, uh, gra uh, twisted graphene bilayers. Uh, twisted graphene on, on boron nitride uh, sub substrate. Very interesting system. They have all kind of interesting stuff. I'll focus on only on one thing, namely Chern insulator. So this is experimental picture from from Santa Barbara, from Andrea Young's group, and there are, it, it, these things are obtained also by other groups as well. This is not the only, maybe not the first, but I, I like this graph. So anyway, so what is this? Uh, so basically what is shown here is resistance, electric resistance, RxX, RxY, resistance and hole resistance as a function of doping. So essentially you take this twisted graphene by layer, you put a gate and you change concentration. You change number of carriers, which is this number N, okay? But what is shown at the top is new. So new is filling factor. Now I will explain a little bit well, what is filling factor? You, you produce more array superstructure. So you have new, new, much bigger unit cell. Okay. And this is the occupation number per unit cell, per, per, per big unit cell. Okay. So anyway, I'll, I will show this in a bit more detail. But what is important is this. New equal to zero, it means undoped graphene. And this is basically trivial insulator. Um, there is this new equal four. New equal four is again, completely filled band, as I'll show you, that is also a trivial insulator. I will show you in a moment. But the interesting stuff happens in new equal three, which is odd, odd number. At new equal three, what experimentally see the blue, the blue curve is whole, whole conductivity, rho x, y. So there's a spike of whole resistivity and the value is actually quantized. So this, this horizontal bars actually show quantized value. I'll show you in a moment in detail. So bottom line system starts to show spontaneous anomalous whole effect and new equal three. And this is shown in more detail here. So this is direct detail trace. So this is whole resistivity rho x, y as a function of applying magnetic field. So if you increase magnetic field, there is some transition and then it basically acquires quantized value. This is plus one in units of E squared over H, whatever it is. So this quantized value, uh, as you decrease magnetic field, it stays this way and then drops, uh, changes to minus quantized value. So bottom line, you have hysteresis where whole resistivity switches between plus minus quantized value. Okay, and this is, and if magnetic field is zero, then the whole resistivity is either plus quantized value or minus quantized value. Okay, so in other words, what you see is anomalous quantum hole effect. There's this quantum hole effect which exists, as you see, in the absence of at zero magnetic field, okay? Uh, and, but it also represents topological memory. The reason for this quantum hole effect is that system acquires, uh, becomes a churn insulator. It becomes an insulator with a non-zero value of churn number. I'll show you in a moment, okay? But this churn number has a sign. It can be plus or minus, right? And this plus and minus are related by time reversal symmetry. So system basically spontaneously breaks time reversal and picks the plus sign or minus sign. And you can think of this as memory. So you can say plus minus is like bit, you know, one or zero, right? And so, you know, in standard uh, magnetic memory, right? It's spin, it's spin memory, right? Your spin cluster is up or down and that's your, you know, bit, you know, represented by spin, spin magnetism. So in this case, this is actually magnetic topological memory originating from orbital magnetism. Again, spins are totally ignored here. Uh, you know, this material has, yeah, okay. So, so this comes from orbital, orbital magnetization effect, but, this memory has topological origin because it's shared number and it's, you know, topologically protected. And by the way, this is, I mean, classical memory. I'm not talking about like topological quantum computer, not at all. This is just uh, classical topological memory, but has orbital mag magnetic origin as opposed to spin magnetic origin, okay? Now, this, 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 this uh, 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 there is a phase transition. So, I mean, this thing, you know, this spontaneous time reversal breaking, it happens in a particular temperature. This is temperature. And so at high temperature, whole resistivity is zero. And then at a particular temperature around like seven and a half Kelvin or so, then whole resistivity starts to, you know, increase. And then finally saturates at quantized value. So bottom line around this temperature, there is a basically second order phase transition where time reversal symmetry is broken. It doesn't look very nice, maybe, you know, but, but, but that's what it is. And at low temperature, it has also energy gap. This is activation plot one over T. So at low temperature, there is a activation gap. Depending how you define it, it is a this or that, but of the order of 30 Kelvin. So pointless, it is an insulator with a well-defined energy gap. And this is, appears in a second order phase transition breaks time reversal symmetry spontaneously, okay? So this is experimental facts, okay? Reproduced by many groups, by the way. It's not a single group. Okay, and now a little bit of a theory and it only two graphs. So this is a theory. I mean, I, mean, I copied the theoretical pictures from, from experimental papers, you know? So I'm not going very deeply. I mean, this is in theoretical interpretation as presented by experimentalists, okay? So why this Chern insulator happens? Okay, let's consider first 
Uh, okay, so what is shown here? Let me explain this. So this is energy spectrum, electron energy spectrum, actually is a function of momentum. Okay, now momentum is actually two-dimensional. Okay, so the brilliant zone is really, really hexagonal brilliant zone. And of course, the two most important points are K and K prime. This is where in original graphene the gap vanishes, the gap vanishes, but because it is on a boron nitride substrate, uh, that that you know makes A B you know two sublattice difference, and that presumably opens the gap. Okay, so bottom line is this is uh, this is okay. What is it? Uh, uh, this is vicinity of really K or K prime, and so you know if if we had undoped system, chemical potential would be here, and so this is a gap in undoped uh, doped system. Now, if you apply doping, if you apply gating, the filling factor in U4. What is U4? You have two valleys, right? And in each value, you have spin up and down, right? So there are four options, right? And so new filling factor nu is equal to four is when, when all, both of these bands are occupied. And I should call, I should say, this are what's called mini bands. These are mini bands produced by periodic superlattice potential by, by, by twisting. And so, uh, yeah, so this is basically folded brilliant zone. So these mini bands produced by, by, by super lattice because of twisting. So bottom line, at nu equal to four, we have a trivial insulator, meaning these bands are completely occupied, chemical potential is in a gap, you know, trivial insulator. Okay, but now let's go to nu equal three. So we take away one electron. So we need to fill the states with three electrons. And the way system does it, it occupies this band completely. And whereas here, it empties spin down or spin up, okay? So in, in one of the valleys, one of the bands for one of the spin becomes empty. Okay, and system, so this is called, uh, it produces spontaneous valley imbalance. So these two values are related by time reversal symmetry. So system spontaneously breaks this time reversal symmetry and decides to populate one valley and not to populate another valley. Okay, and this is because of Coulomb rip interaction. This is 100% because of interaction between reactions. And this is roughly speaking, is roughly speaking, I think, similar to Hun's rule. You know, remember if, you know, if reactions in the, you know, if they, if they can, they prefer to have spins parallel because it makes spin wave function symmetric, then space wave function becomes anti-symmetric and that suppresses, reduces Coulomb repulsion. So for that reason, they prefer to have the spins aligned. And that's exactly what they do. They actually decide to populate spin, uh, say up and you know, empty spin down. And also they decide to populate one value as opposed to another value, okay? So bottom line, in this case, the symmetry is broken and that produces a non-zero Berry curvature. First of all, it produces non-zero Chern number and Berry curvature. First of all, for this band, the chair number is equal one and the bishop band minus one. So as you can see uh, here, the total chair number, I mean, here total chair number is zero because plus and minus cancel out, plus, minus, 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 et cetera. Here one band is not populated, so chair number is not equal to zero. And so the system becomes chair insulator. Or put it differently, uh, it has no, uh, you know, the integral of very curvature will be not zero because look, at, at, if you take this momentum, if you take this momentum, uh, the Berry curvature of the upper and lower band is opposite. So the total Berry curvature for this momentum is zero, okay, because up and down cancel out. But if you take momentum here in another valley, the Berry curvature is not zero because you see this is completely occupied, but this is partially empty. Okay, so the total Berry curvature for this momentum is not zero. So basically you get non-zero Berry curvature around one valley. And if you integrate it around this mini band, you get an integer number, okay? And system does it spontaneously. Okay, so, so this is roughly speaking illustrated here with free energy. I mean, in the absence of any other external fields, the free energy is a function of this order parameter. Horizontal axis is this order parameter, which represents value imbalance. Okay, uh, it should have equal minima. This are equal minima, the system spontaneously decides, randomly decides plus or minus, which will produce plus or minus uh, uh, whole resistivity or plus or minus magnetization. By the magnetization was actually measured experimentally using squeeze magnetometer as well. However, if you apply magnetic field, external magnetic field, then you break the symmetry, right? And you make one of the minima lower than the other. And then you basically try to guide, you basically can control, you can tell system which minimum to go. So you can control this memory by applying magnetic field. And finally, the drum roll in the last, well, 10 or so minutes of the talk, the my big modest proposition is the following. Control, oops. Okay, yeah. Control this mem uh, boy, boy, boy. Control this memory, control this chair number based memory. Instead of magnetic field, use circularly polarized light to control this memory, to, to make this minima not equal, okay, by shining circularly polarized light. 
which is which is a, a, a permitted by symmetry and which is this you know and and which is described by this energy that I did. So anyway, so now basically yes, optical control of orbital magnetization, Chern oscillator. This is just again summary of that theory, which by the way was developed. This is paper by Leonid Levitov and collaborators, 1915. This was actually before the experiments were done. They propose this idea of you know mini bands and uh, they call it Schoenbergers uh, because you slice bands. So anyway, so bottom line, let's say you have two bands occupied on empty, and if you have non-zero Berry curvature, so the integral of Berry curvature gives you whole conductivity. That's the quantized value you have seen. Also, some other integral of Berry curvature with some other prefactor gives you magnetization. Okay, so system has a you know non-zero static magnetization, but also the integral I showed you on the previous slide of of Berry curvature, some other prefactor gives you this curly vector m, which represents coupling uh, to the circularly polarized light. So bottom line, if you shine circularly polarized light with non-zero helicity, then uh, then you, you break symmetry and you make one of the two options more favorable than the other. And very importantly, people may ask me, how big is this term? What's the coefficient of the numbers? Yeah, we have some estimates in the paper, but in fact, in my opinion, they're not really important. Reason is the following. If you consider a near TC, let's consider Landau expansion near TC, near the transition. Remember, this is second order phase transition, right? So near the second order phase transition, the Landau energy expansion in the order parameter, M is magnetic order parameter. You see, you can use any of these three variables as your order, magnetic order parameters, whatever you like, okay? So it's quadratic, you know, the lowest row term is quadratic, and this is TMITC, this is what changes sign of second order phase transition. So it's quadratic and there is quartic, right? But this term coupling to light is linear in M, see it's linear. So that means near TC, the coupling to light is always stronger, is, is always, it always dominates. Okay, so this coupling to light uh, will be always dominating over everything else. So in that sense, coupling to light will be always strong uh, near TC and will force system to go one way or another. So specifically, this is experimental protocol uh, that we are proposing and I'm trying to convince experimentalists to actually do it. Uh, so basically the idea is this, as a function of time, we start at the relatively high temperature, we start at the temperature, it's a time, you know, experimental time. Okay, so we start at temperature above transition temperature. Okay, then we start to, you know, decrease temperature. So we decrease temperature either by, you know, you know, by whatever means, you, you crank up your cryostat or alternative, you're concerned about heating. Maybe you shine very high laser power and then you start decreasing laser power and that will, you know, cool the sample. By whatever way, you cool the sample gradually. And then at this point of time, the so temperature decreases and then you reach transition temperature TC. So whole conductivity is zero above TC. So at this point, non-zero whole conductivity starts to appear. Uh, and the sign of it, the sign will be determined by the circular polarization of light, okay, sense of circular polarization. And then you, as you decrease well below TC, you can drop off, you switch off your laser and system stays in this state. So you don't need to shine light to maintain this memory. You just need to initiate it and then it stays by itself. Okay, so in this, in principle, this is basically a kind of magnetic memory device based on orbital rather than spin magnetization and you know, topological features. And one last thing to add to this, what you can do with this, potentially, potentially, hypothetically, what you can try, if, if that works, of course, nobody has done it yet, but if that works, you can try something more, you can try to shine actually on a sample two beams of light with opposite circular polarization, then you would nucleate domains of the opposite chirality, and then these domains will grow, and then eventually they will create a domain wall, and this domain wall has a chiral bound states, uh, yeah, chiral, chiral H states. They have chiral H states moving in one direction, okay? And people had quite a bit of interest in this uh, chiral H states because uh, they are dissipationless because they cannot backscatter. They can only go one way and not backscatter. Some people propose, I'm not sure if it's any kind of realistic, use them as interconnects uh, for electric circuits to suppress resistivity. But the beauty is this, Using this optical thing, one can optically write those domains. You can do this optically reconfigurable. You can put beams here and, and channel here, or beams there, channel there. So you can reconfigure channels optically. Wow, I'm almost run out of time. I still have sort of, this is, end, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway, <laughs> any questions? Okay, yes, question. Uh, yes, how to read it out? That by curve effect, okay? There is actual polar curve effect. You shine linear polarized light when it reflects, the polarization rotates, you can read it off. And in fact, this kind of experiments have been done. Maybe on the next slide, I'll actually tell you something a little bit about, yes. You can optically write and optically read. 
So it will be magnetic memory completely optically controlled, you know. Okay. So now uh, one more slide on this topic, other materials. So this was graphene by layers. There is another material which was, was this chernozoic was also observed. This is a dehalcogenide. This is by layers of different dehalcogenide material. This was done in Cornell. Uh, and Kim Feimak, you know, the leader of the group, he will actually give Jake my seminar two weeks from now. Okay, so he will probably show some of that and you can ask him more questions about. Uh, so this system is more complicated and this is so far the only group that managed to do it because layers are different, you know, you have different layers on top and bottom. So you use top and bottom gates, you use two different gates to control top and bottom separately. And somewhere, so this is gate, you know, back gate and top gate voltage, somewhere in some remote corner of phase diagram, this quantum hole state is observed. And this is quantum hole traces. So at low temperature, at low temperature. So basically have again, very good quantization of hole effect and hysteresis. Okay, and then you go to high temperature, everything gets washed out because there's transition temperature. Okay, so this is another system where quantum, you know, anomalous, you know, which is observed. And this is now, this is now speculative. Kagome systems, I show you theoretical paper. This is much, very much speculative. I'll not show you an experiment because it's kind of controversial. This is, uh, this is this system has Kagome lattice, which is different from you know it's not honeycomb lattice, Kagome lattice, which is more complicated. But the point is, according to some theoretical models in the brilliant zone, the, this is a hexagonal brilliant zone, but the Fermi surface has flat portions, it has flat parts, and those can be gapped by charge density waves. So the system spontaneously develops three charge density wave gaps, which it's density waves, which gap out that Fermi surface. But it turns out those three density waves may have relative phase, all the parameter is complex, etc. And according to theories, okay, it may produce currents, spontaneous currents in the side of the unit cell. And so these currents. You know, it's called charge density, it's bond density wave is non-local, it's not necessarily on, on site, it may be on the bond, etc. And so it breaks some rules of symmetry, supposedly, and maybe it is a churn insulator, it's not very clear. There is some experimental evidence for time also breaking. And it's about you know eight Kelvin phase transition, 80 Kelvin phase transition, but it's controversial, so it's subject to not settle. Uh, it's a potential candidate, but we don't really know for sure yet. It's it's, it's too, too far. And maybe last thing I wanted to mention is optical control of spin magnetism. I told you about optical control of orbital magnetism, uh, but you may ask what about spin magnets, right? And in fact, this is a very active area of research. And in particular, Professor Chen Guang, he's assistant professor and electrical engineer here at UMD. He actually gave a talk here at JQI on, uh, on uh, in, in January. They actually use a spin magnet, you know, iron-based magnet, you know, and they use actually circular polarized to control and read out, read and write, I mean, write and read uh, spin organization. So this, that's not the subject of my talk. From my perspective, spins are more complicated because basically electric field of light does not couple directly to spin. Spin is magnetic moment, electric, so there is no direct coupling. So I think my speculation is the way it works in this system and spin systems is that this, the rotation electric field induces orbital angular momentum. And then because of spin orbit interaction, orbital angular momentum affects the spin and that's how it controls. But again, it needs to be worked out. Boy, I think I pretty much ran out of time, but <sighs> optical light, didn't get to optical lattice. So maybe I can take maybe five minutes because this is an IO, this is very important for this. It will be much shorter. This will be much shorter. Two minutes, okay. Okay, so you take now, you take now, yeah, yeah, okay. You take optical lattice and shake it. Shake it meaning that you just take it and shift it. You shift it by, by vector R, which depends on time. This was done in by Esslinger and Zurich. And also, you know, I, I last, you know, Trey Porter's group, I know, attended this uh, PhD defense last week. So, you know, there are groups who do this. Now, because you shake that lattice, if you go to a reference frame of the lattice, then electrons experience, you know, this force of inertia. And this force of inertia for atoms are neutral, but they experience force of inertia, which plays the same role as electric field. So basically, what I take whatever I told you before and transfer it to neutral atoms. Instead of electric field, you have force of inertia, but mathematically, that's exactly the same. So let me start. Uh, okay, this might be the main slide on that. The two slides, and that's it. I'm done. Okay, so let's take one dimensional system, okay, like AB latches. And if you shake it circularly, then what happens by symmetry, you see. Uh, uh, rotating uh, rotation, uh, light is like perpendicular magnetic field, and there is AB, you know, non equivalent sizes like dipole moment. So, dipole moment is like electric field. So, you have like crossed electric field in transverse direction, magnetic field perpendicular to the board. What you're going to get, you get current along the chain. And this is called circular photogalvanic effect, which is a well known effect in, and also controversial in, in solid state physics. So, I want to apply it to optical lattice. So, basically, I take that, you know, optical lattice, I calculate this very correction everything in a certain bottom line. Yeah, I now consider bosons. 
okay, instead of fermions, okay? So bosons occupy k equal to zero state. I, I will assume they're not boson condensed. They're just quasi particles. No boson can you say, but they occupy the vicinity of k equal to zero. And so what happens is, now we, have, we start shaking, start with circular stirring of the lattice, and that produces this energy shift related to Berry curvature and helicity of, of this uh, stirring. Okay, but, but if you take time gradient with respect, that gives uh, group velocity. Uh, and so basically, if you take this point k equal to zero, the Berry curve is odd with respect to momentum. So bottom line is, these bosons at k equal to zero, they acquire non-zero group velocity, okay? So they start moving along the chain, okay? Uh, or more precisely, their dispersion relation, the original one, it acquires term linear in momentum, and so they acquire velocity. So what happens to them is this. Um, so if you consider the bottom of the band, you have this parabolic bottom of the band, so the bottoms, the bottoms are here. Once you start shaking it, or shaking, you promote uh, bosons here, you get energy shift, and you get energy slope. So now these bosons have a non-zero group velocity, and they start moving. Okay, so that's a new current. However, what will happen next? If you have a finite system, finite size system, they will actually reach the end of the system, will bounce back and go backward. So they they basically go from point B, you know, to point C, which is opposite opposite group velocity. So they'll basically bounce back and forth, back and forth, until they presumably will eventually relax to point D uh, at the bottom, and then it will stay velocity will be zero. So the prediction expectation is that this this induced current will be transient. It will exist for a while until system relaxes to the true ground state and then current will be zero, okay? And this is subject of actually big controversy in condensed matter because some people, you know, papers and literature, you know, claiming the opposite, but anyway. And this is really the last slide. So this was one dimensional case. You can also do it in two dimensional. I mean, you have, you know, this anisotropic honeycomb lattice. And so in this case, the, the current is actually sum of three currents, three contributions along each zigzag chain. There are three zigzag chains, each gives some contribution. And by controlling coefficients, you can basically produce current in arbitrary direction. You know, you can control direction of the current. And also, if you turn on shaking for a given amount of time, you displace them for given over a given distance in a given direction. So you can move, you know, at will bosons of the slightest potential in this effect. And finally, this is a credit to JQI. Something very similar <laughs> had been seen, you know, this pioneering paper, you know, synthetic electric field, etc. You know, I'm not going to detail, but bottom line is this well-known paper, you know, Ian Spielman and collaborators. You know, you basically take the system and you create the synthetic fields, and now the the quadratic band gets shifted. The bottom, the the minimum gets shifted, and sure enough, the minimum gets shifted, and then the atoms start to oscillate. When you turn this on, the atoms start to oscillate back and forth. And so, bottom line is what I'm proposing is actually you know, in terms of phenomena, it's actually quite similar, but of course, origin is different. This is not electric, uh, synthetic electric field, might be storing, but otherwise it's similar. And also I can reduce current by maybe applying non-sinusoidal drive, which breaks time also similar some option, et cetera. But anyway, that's it. These are my conclusions. Uh, you know, maybe since I lost it all of my time, I will not even say them, but I'll thank you. And uh, thanks a lot for the, for the question.